Do you want to make all your PCG points look at a specific direction? Want to make something creepy potentially using some teddy bears? Well, in this tutorial, I'm going to be showing you how to recreate this, which is just a bunch of points facing a single point. And it works across multiple. If you have multiple points, they will just face another and another and another section. And I'll also show you a setup where you can have every point look towards the next point exactly. So if you want to see, have them all look at each other in a line or in a group or in a pattern any way you want to see which ones go into the which point it'll also be very simple using the similar method so let me show you both ways let's get started to get started of course we need to make sure pcg is turned on by going to edit plugins search for pcg and turning on the procedural content generation framework pcg make sure that it's on and restart your engine as needed so let's get started on the method where it follows the next point for that i'm just going to right click grab ourselves a pcg graph there's going to be an empty graph and call this pcg spline follow because i'll just have have the points follow each other along a spline and I'll show you what I mean in a moment. I'll also of course need a blueprint class of a type actor. This is going to be BP underscore spline follow. I'll open up the blueprint and add ourselves a simple spline component. Let's go ahead and extend this to make this a little bit longer and I'll add a PCG component and plug in our PCG graph in the detail panel. And that's all I really want here. At this point I can just drag this out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw out by holding alt and dragging out a very curved curved path here to kind of show you what I'm talking about. In fact, I'm actually going to take some of these points and I'm really going to extend this in ways that are going to break visually, but it'll kind of explain what exactly I'm doing a lot better. Let's go with something like this. So now let's go ahead and open up the PCG spline follow. We of course need to get the spline graph. So we'll grab the spline data and then we do a spline sampler. And I'm going to change this from subdivision to distance. And the distance here I'll set up to be 200. And if I press D to debug this, it is hard to see what's going on because of how the points are. But if you want them to looking like cubes, you could change the scale method from extents to absolute and leave it at 1.0. So now you'll see that these points kind of are going along and they're turning and they're going everywhere. Now it is hard to tell how they're turning. So what you can do is in the debug, we can change the mesh, but I don't want to do it on this mesh. Instead, I'm going to drag out and grab ourselves a debug node here. And we're going to set it up on this debug. So for the point mesh, instead of PCG cube, I search for axis and we can grab a PCG axis tripod. And then just like the previous one, we're going to change it from extents to absolute point scale of one is fine. And now you will see, well, there's our points. So the red axis, the X axis is forward. And you can see along right here, it is not facing towards the point. It is facing where the tangent of the this spot in the spline is. If we continue on, right, and they're not actually facing the next point. They're only facing where this tangent effectively of this point along the spline is. So if we wanted to create a fence, for example, and instead of this debug here, I used a static mesh spawner and I plugged in a simple mesh of a fence here. It's a very basic one here. I'm willing to adjust the spacing because it is 171 in X. So if I just change the spline sampler here to instead of 200, I'll put something like 170 or really we need a little bit of overlapping so maybe like 160 and now you'll see that well it's definitely better we probably need to decrease the spacing a bit more be 150 and now it overlaps a little bit better but the point is here at these locations right it is not going the right way at all and especially here you could really see it's breaking up so really what we'd like to do is have them face towards the next point now how do we do that well thankfully it's really simple to do all we do is take this spline sampler and before the static per spawner we drag out and use a create spline now you might be wondering why are we taking a spline and and then sampling it and then creating another spline. That's because on this spline, we're going to tell it to be linear. Linear means it is no longer going to care about all of these curves. It's just going to go point to point to point, which means now if we do another spline sampler and on this one, we keep it on subdivision of zero. So it effectively retains only the original points. If we use a static mesh spawner now, you will see it is now following exactly from one point to the other. Now it is not automatically scaling. Of course, the distance here, that is still a separate thing, but you could see they're now all attached correctly. No matter where it is, it is going towards the next point in line. If I go ahead and move this debug to the very end, instead of static mesh spawner, as you can see, this red arrow will now face towards the next point. And since we use these points from the original sample to create it, it is now correctly doing this. So that's how easily you can make a simple fence or anything like that exactly follow towards the next point, even when you're trying to do a curved graph like this. Because if you were to set this up manually through a linear 
curve, it's going to be kind of a pain in the butt. You have to make so many points. It's not worth it. Use a curved path and just have them face towards the next one. Now, keep in mind, the last one here, the last point here, will just continue looking straight as it does. It doesn't have another point ahead of it. So that's how to create a simple path that just follows along exactly to the next piece. Now, using the same method, we can do this on a 3D scale of having points look at something, which is why I wanted to show you this in before we got into the main teddy bear scenario. But don't worry, that one too is relatively simple. Let's go ahead and get started by right clicking and grab ourselves a new PCG graph. We'll make an empty graph. This is going to be our PCG underscore look at. And this one, we're going to use a volume for this to show you you can do this in three dimensions. So I'll just drag it out into the world and just place it somewhere up here. And now before I'm going to edit the graph, I'm just going to add a few things. I'm going to add some target points, just some regular target points. These will be the things that actually we're looking at in the world. So I'll go ahead and just drag a few of these around in the world. And this is where we're going to go from. And depending on your asset, how many points you have, you might want to increase the bounds. So for example, I can go ahead and increase it to 50 and spread these out a little bit more. And by the way, if these are too small in the world and you're having trouble finding them, just select them. And in the detail panel, search for bill for billboard and editor billboard size. You can up this to, let's say five, and you'll see they now get considerably bigger so you can see them from further away. And then let's get started with the PCG graph. We're going to need two things. First, let's go ahead and sample the volume. For that, we're going to need the input, which is going to be our volume itself. And we're going to use a simple volume sampler. The voxel size, I'm going to increase a little bit to 150 by 150 by 150. And then I'm going to use a transform points node to offset those points randomly. Now we're doing 150. So I'm going to offset them by half by negative 75 in X, Y, and Z to positive 75 in X, Y, and Z. And then just so I can see the points easier, I'll use a bonds modifier and I'll scale them to like 0.2 in every single axis. So now if I press D on this bounds modifier, you can see we have a bunch of points here in this area. Now we don't want to actually spawn every single one of these as something that will be way too much. We're only going to work with certain areas of this, specifically around the points. For your setup, all you're going to need to do is filter out the points that you want facing towards something and then just edit those and output the rest as normal. Of course, if you want all of your points to look at something, then of course, do all of them. This is just way too many points, so we're going to filter out a few. But now that we have this, the next thing we need is, of course, the target points. To get those is relatively simple. Just right click, search for get actor data. You want the spatial get actor data. The actor filter will be all world actors. We're going to go by class and we're going to use a target point because that is what we have. We're going to turn on select multiple and the mode here is going to be single point. We do not want to merge the simple data. So if I press A on this, we want to keep it on every single point individually as data points here. The reason we want to do it this way is because we need to loop on this and tell the points in the area around each of these points to look towards that point. So for every point, you effectively have to loop through the areas that you need to, which is why it's easier when you have less points, as I was mentioning before. Also, keep in mind, this is not meant for runtime moving of heads, for example. You'd want to use something like blueprints and have maybe PCG spawn those blueprints with instanced actors to only do them at certain ranges. There's ways of doing that if you want me to show you how to do that, just let me know in the comments below. But for this, this is all we need. And now that we have these two pieces of data, we need to create a loop to go through all of these target points and make these points look at them and filter out only what we need. So here in the content browser, I'm going to right click, grab ourselves a PCG graph, empty graph again. This is going to be our PCG loop look at. And I'm just going to take it, drag it in, and select the bottom option to create a loop node. And then I'll just double click to open it. For the inputs here, we're going to need two actual input point types. We're first going to need to have the look at targets, which are the target points. They're going to be of a type loop and they're going to accept points. Now I've gone ahead and made them required. So you have to plug something in. And the second input is going to be the rest of our points. Of course, allow type points and also required. And then for our outputs, we have the rotated points and the regular points. In case you don't want those points rotated, we have a second copy of them basically here. They're allowed type point and this pin status is normal. Now that we have those in here, we can go ahead and plug them in here. So we're just going to plug this in here, plug that in there. And for rotated, we'll go ahead and just add a simple debug here and I'll add the axis tripod and I'll just set it to absolute one for our debug. So that way, once we have everything hooked up, we'll be able to see it immediately. And now let's go to the loop node. So the first thing we want to do is only take things that are a certain distance away from the points. For that, you just need a distance node. So from the look at targets, we'll drag out and search for distance. But the distance actually needs the loop at targets to be the target because the points are going to be the source. The points are the ones that are looking at the targets. So if you'd like, you can 
absolutely just go ahead and swap these around by just clicking and dragging here. Change the order of these. And you can also change the order here. So now they're all the way through exactly the same. Straight through here, straight through here. What this distance does is it outputs to an attribute called distance. So if I press A here and scroll to the right, you'll see there's the distance of each of these points and how far they are from a target point, the specific one that we have here. And you can see here all the points. So now all we need to do is use an attribute filter or an attribute filter range. I'll go ahead and use attribute filter range because I want to specify the minimum and the maximum range here. So the target attribute that we want to do here is distance, exactly what it was called here. So we can even copy paste it through. And then for the min threshold, I'll go ahead and open it up and change it to a constant threshold and minimum will be 400. And the maximum here again will be a constant threshold with a maximum of 700. So if I just take this inside filter and just drag it into rotate it already, you will see we already have a range in here where we're filtering out just a little kind of thick layer of points around each of these points, which is great. Okay, so this part is done, but now we need to have them rotated. But we effectively need to add this look at target, whichever one is in here to these points, but each one separately. So we effectively need to partition them into individual points and add that look at target to each one. Unfortunately, in the merge points operation, it will just make them all one data set and we need them to be separate data sets for this. But don't worry, there's a way of doing that. From our inside filter, we'll drag out and search for get points count to know how many points there are. And then we want to just go ahead and subtract one from there. Now, why do we want to subtract one? Because we're going to be using a node called duplicate point. Now, this point just creates duplicates of each point with optional transform offsets. And because it duplicates the point, it still keeps the original, which is why we want to know how many points there are and minus one for the original and then duplicate the point that many times. Now, what point are we duplicating? Because this is an attribute. This just goes into the iterations. The point that we want to use is the look at targets here. That is the one we need to duplicate. The target point we're copying enough times to be equal to the amount of points there are inside of this filter. If I press A here, you'll see I have a bunch of points. But one thing you might notice is your Z position is changing. We don't want this. The reason it's changing is because in the detail panel of the duplicate point, direction is set to 1.04 Z. We don't want it moving at all. So we put direction on zero for everything. So now all axes, every single value here is exactly duplicated, exactly the amount of times that you have inside of this filter. Filter. As you can see here, there's 558 here. And if I press A on this, you'll see 558 points here as well. So perfect. The next thing we want to do is store the index of these. So that way we can match index to index. So from here, I'm just going to use a set attribute. And for in A and in B are both going to be plugged in from the out. Input source one will be index. Input source two will be index, but it's going to be output to a new one, which is going to be our match index. So we're just taking the index basically and storing it somewhere else. Now because we're doing that for this, we also want to do it for the filter points as well. So I'm going to take the set and I'm going to duplicate it and do the same thing for this inside filter here. So both of these will have an attribute if I press A all the way in the right that says match index and the match index will go all the way through everything all the way to 557 on this one as well as 557 here. So great, that is working well. So now we need to combine these two. So I'm going to right click and search for merge points and I want this in specific order. So I'll add an extra pin and this set node from the original point not the ones that we duplicated are going to the first time and the second one is going to be the one from the set node that we duplicated that is going to be in two because we want to make sure that the original points are the first point and the target point effectively is the second point order does matter so now that we have all of these all combined we need to partition by them so we'll do an attribute partition and in the detail panel here we'll partition by what we called it which is this match index that we've set just previously so in here we're going to change this at last to match index now if I press a here, you will see we have two points. And if I select any of them, the first one will be different. But the second one, if I scroll to the left, so you can see the positions here will never change because that is the points information. But I'm here on loop two. So if I change it to loop one, you can see when we go to a different loop, it will change the one slot here. So fantastic. We now have a bunch of different data. So what we can do is create splines from them. So from here, we'll do the same thing as before. Use a create spline node, set it to be linear. So it's going to go from our original point to the target point. And once again, use a spline sampler with subdivision set to zero. We've effectively created splines from one to the other. But we only need to keep the original one. We don't care about the actual target point. We don't want a spline. We don't need both of these values. So all we do is just drag out and just get attribute from point index. And this is why order of operation matters. We need to grab the first index, which is index zero, and that will go into our 
rotated output. And immediately, if we take a look, well, there you go. All of them with their X forward axis are now facing towards this target point. And if we go all the way here, you can see these are also facing towards it. And so are these. Now, something to note, you could absolutely make more. And if you overlap them, you will get double points. So you'll have a potentially a point that looks in both directions. So you see, for example, this one here from this point has an arrow this way and this way. If you don't want them to do this, if you want to make sure that it doesn't pick the same point multiple times, you can go to the original main graph. Let's detach the debug for now. I first want to use a bounds modifier here because if I go ahead and debug the bounds right now, you'll see that we have kind of the big stripes here and we just want the point. So for this bounds modifier, we're just going to change the bounds min to be negative one in all axes and we're going to change the mode to set. So now we have just little points. We can make them bigger, of course, but it doesn't matter. They're perfectly overlapping. And once we modified all of them, we just need to do a merge points here. We want them all to be in the same data set now. So if you wanted to do something per line, do it before this. But once you've merged them all, just drag out and do a self pruning node. And what we want to do is cut away the overlapping. And we're going to go small to large. So it prioritizes small distances over large distances. And the comparisons will be distance. Based on the distance, go small to large. And if we plug in the debug all the way at the end here, you'll see these points now face this way because that is the closest point. But if I have another point is potentially closer, it will face towards that one. You see, these are all facing towards here, and eventually they will start facing towards the other one. Now, keep in mind that this does not cut out the points that are overlapping over the original area. So, for example, these points of this one are now overlapping where the cutout of this area was, and it doesn't account for that, but I'll leave it to you guys to figure that out for yourselves. It'll be done the same way as before using just a simple difference node. But now we have each one of these facing different areas. Now, so instead of a debug, already, we can instead now use a simple static mesh spawner. And in the mesh entry here, I can put in my teddy bear head. And now if I go inside the circle, you can see they're all kind of looking at me very creepily. They're a bit small. So I'm just going to use a transform points node here and scale it by 2x and then plug that in. That's better. That's a lot better. Potentially a little bit creepier, which is good, but they're missing their body. And we can absolutely just duplicate this. And for the second static mesh point, we can put in their body if we want them to just completely look at us from any angle. So we have the body and the head there, but I want the body to still face down like it is just lying on the ground. To do that, let's go back to our look at loop graph and we need to plug in this normal. And for that one, we just grab the one from the set node. Just take it, drag it all the way through into the normal. We're just not doing the merge points with these. We're doing everything else. So these are the exact same points, but these are not rotated. If you wanted to, you could also output the outside filter. Then you would get all the points that are outside of the spheres if you want to keep those points as well, as well as inside this area here. But once we have that, we can go ahead and plug them in from the normal. I'll go ahead and duplicate the transform points here, plug that through, and again, plug that into here. So it'll be double the size. The difference is on this one, I'm going to change it to be 360 degrees in Z rotation. The only downside to this is we need to really do the same thing we did here because there are going to be times where we have overlapping pieces. Now, because we don't care which way they face in this scenario, we don't actually need to use the distance one. We can just use self pruning by extents or just duplicate. But to make it simple, I'll just duplicate all of these, plug them in and plug this all the way through. And now if we take a look. We have the bears rotating randomly and all looking at us from everywhere. And again, if we go ahead and overlap these in the areas where they're overlapping, there will only be one and we'll be looking at whichever one's closer. For example, this one is in this nice overlap area. So are these and they're finding that, you know what, that point is actually closer than that point. So they're looking at this point. But again, only the ones that are overlapping and we can make as many as we, of these as we want. So there we go. That's how you make little tiny bears seem absolutely creepy. More or less, this whole thing boils down to just create a spline, set it to be linear and sample it. And now you have one point facing another. It is simple as that. Now, if you'd like to play around with the bears for yourself, they'll be available on my Patreon, where you can join these wonderful people here and supporting what I do. It really means a lot. And if you'd like to join the community, the link to the Discord and everything else will be down below as always. And if you're looking for more awesome PCG tutorials, check out this one right over here, which is one of my recent favorites.